What's good everybody, I'm Keandre, this is Hoop Intellect, and welcome back to the channel. Now, I felt like a great time to go ahead and do an updated big board with all the draft lottery and combine stuff coming up. Speaking of which, here are some of those important dates and info for the draft. We have the G League Elite Camp coming up on the 16th and 17th. Those who perform well there can be invited to the official NBA Draft Combine, which also starts the week of the 16th. The draft lottery is on the 17th. I know a lot of you have had that date circle for a minute now. Um, so we have a big couple weeks coming up. The withdrawal deadline is on the 13th of June and then the draft is on June 23rd. Obviously nothing significant has really happened since the last time we did one of these. I've just been able to watch more and think about a few different things so my opinions have changed in some areas. Be sure to leave a like it really helps out the channel and we'll go ahead and get it started with some of those right outside the top 60. I think we're going to see a handful of undrafted free agents find their way from this class, maybe even a few more than normal. I could go on for days about some of the players in here and I might actually make a more detailed video on some of these undrafted guys, but that'll be a little bit more down the line. I'm not 100% sure how David Roddy's game will change or how much will translate to the next level, but he can go. He's a sort of power guard who is sneaky athleticism personified and to keep it simple is a pretty solid bet on a combination of scoring prowess and high feel despite being older and the size of most tight ends. Khalifa Jop is still a bit of a project but the 6'11 Senegalese big man is a great athlete with high defensive and vertical spacing potential. He won the 2022 Euro Cup Rising Star Award which is essentially the second level of European basketball. Guys like Porzingis and Jonas Valanciunas have won this in the past. One of the more impressive passers in the class, Travion Williams has a great chance of carving out a role for that, his scoring skill set, and overall agility. He doesn't have the same motor or explosion, but Montrez Harrell's game has always felt like the sort of blueprint for him to put his own spin on. Jabari Walker kind of floats in and out of my top 60, but every time I go back and revisit him, he just has to be in here. He's too good and versatile as a defender, and while it didn't live up to the freshman expectations, he was solid enough as a three-point shooter, especially down the stretch, to be confident in his progression there. He finished well around the rim, and I could easily see him carving out a role in that combo forward spot for a good team. Now Peyton Watson had one of the weirdest freshman seasons of a consensus one and done prospect that I've seen. He finished the year with averages of 3-3, three and three, shot 32% from the field, played about 13 minutes a game, and that's all kind of been placed entirely on the situation. He has great tools, we saw a lot of flashes defensively, and he's a very good athlete but he has a lot of work to do. I'm interested to see how he looks at the combine because he is a raw talent, but he'll need to show a little more to convince he belongs in that top 40 range. So far. I like UCLA taking a deep breath here. You know, not having a rush. Wow. Caleb Houston will not be participating in the draft combine, so one can only assume that either means he has a promise in a spot that he likes or has maybe made the preemptive decision to go back to Michigan. He was pretty inconsistent. I personally would consider him a firm second round guy and usually the promises mean first round mostly in the 20 to 30 range but the 6'8 freshman who has great shooting and defensive potential and can make a few plays for others surely still has a lot of interest especially given his pedigree. I've been surprised that Jordan Hall hasn't gotten more love on a larger scale. There's obvious connector potential for him being a 6'8 guard slash wing who can really pass. He's a solid shooter and displays a lot of effort defensively. He might not be able he might not be a great individual shot creator, but I think he'll really shine at the G League Combine and then make his way to the NBA Combine. I've been pretty high on Julian Champagny for two years now if you followed for that long. He's a talented scorer and while the splits were down, he definitely got better this year in my opinion. He's got another chance at the Combine and I think he shines and boosts his stock back into everyone's mid-second at the very worst. There are probably about 7 to 10 really strong prospects that I think can and should be in this mix. Believe me, I spent enough time really trying to find a spot for them in here, but hopefully a few open up throughout the process. And again, I think we could very easily see a good group of undrafted standouts depending on how draft night shakes out. 
Musa Diabate fits the modern 4-5 man archetype, especially defensively. He's mobile, good athlete, has some ability to grab and go. Still a very raw offensive player, but that motor versatility and general upside should give him a lot of first round interest in this class. And even though he somewhat fell under the radar this year, I think he could be the one and done that kind of surprises people with a late stock run. I still feel like I'm probably too low on Keon Ellis. I think he has an easy shot to be that 3 and D wing off the bench and maybe even a bit more looking at his ridiculous numbers off the dribble in lower volume. The 6'6 wing out of Alabama should be a target for everyone in the second round. JD Davison continues to be one of the tougher players for me to rank. The athletic gifts are obvious, he had some tremendous moments, especially when given more of the reins, but on the contrary, he had games where he did almost nothing positive and the turnovers were in abundance. I think I'm most comfortable considering him once we start getting into the second round at this point. If you watched Josh Minot at Memphis this season, you know what he's capable of, even in the limited minutes. He's a terrific athlete, was super impactful as a defender, can handle it some, and there's really just a lot of untapped potential there. He did enter the transfer portal, so that could be interesting to watch, but I'd honestly expect him to be a late riser, maybe make some first round buzz, but at the worst, end up somewhere in the top 40. At this point, I'd say there's a good chance Jalen Williams returns to Arkansas to be part of what should be the most talented team they've ever had in Fayetteville. He's going through the draft process, will be at the combine, but weighing the NIL with another chance to solidify first round status, that'd be my guess. But he's definitely worthy this year as a glue energy big who could pass it and has an overall great feel for the game. I have some of these bigs in the same general vicinity. One of them is Arizona's Christian Coloco. Looking to be the next Cameroonian success in the league, I think teams from the mid-20s on will consider adding him for his rim protection, vertical spacing, and overall impact. Harrison Ingram's combination of size, playmaking, and overall feel for the game will likely get him a few late first round looks with the biggest likelihood is he lands in the early second. He's a pretty unorthodox player and definitely won't wow you physically, but it's hard not to be intrigued by what he does out there. I'm very curious to see Max Christie at the combine. He has all the tools to be an eventual longtime starter in the league, but he does have a ways to reach that in terms of shooting and scoring consistency first and foremost. I think he's a definite candidate to break out next year at Michigan State if that's what he decides. But my guess would be he lands somewhere in the second if he keeps his name in. Hugo Besson is one of the most talented and creative shot creators and playmakers at the guard spot. I really like what he does on that end, but defensively I have some concerns that kind of hold him back for me just a little bit. He should bring value as an instant offense guy off the bench, and any team looking to fill that role, he should be at the top of the list. There's an argument for Gabriel Proceda to be much higher than this. He's raw, but a very good athlete, intriguing scorer and shooter, and has great positional size at 6'7". I could see him ending up as high as the 30s on my board. Marquez Justin Lewis had an excellent second season, made significant progress as a shooter and overall score. He still has some work to do in terms of his consistency, control, and defensive impact, but he's a good prospect that you'd like to have in your program to bring along. He's part of the long list of big wings or power forwards in this class, likely somewhere in that second round mix. I would not be surprised if Ishmael Kamagate becomes the best non-durance center in the class. He's been productive all season for Paris basketball playing at a pretty high level. I think he has the most potential to really shoot it of the labeled rim protectors and lob threats. And to me, his draft range spans somewhere from the late first into the second round. the sleeper list this year a 6'6 wing who's proven himself as a shooter checks boxes defensively and routinely made plays for others is my current bet to really shock his way through this process and eventually end up higher on everyone's boards than he's currently ranked i was surprised to see him in the g league combine i think he's a notch above many of those names but i'm very confident he makes his way to the official nba combine Wendell Moore still kind of feels like he's floating under the radar despite being, in my opinion, one of the more well-rounded prospects. 
Teams like the Nuggets, Nets, Grizzlies, Thunder will all likely consider adding his skill set on the wing in the 20s and then others into the second round. I say Trevor Keels has a decent chance of getting into the first round this year with his skill set as a high level defender. I'm still banging the drum that he's going to shoot it much better in the future and he's also a solid playmaker. Now that Duke team could still use his talent at the guard spot, but to me, he's already league ready. After an eye-opening Nike Hoop Summit run, Leonard Miller has become draft eligible and declared with Arizona, Kentucky in the G League also being options for him. I believe we briefly mentioned him in a past board. I know he was at least highlighted on one of those honorable mentions, mainly because it was unsure if he'd even be eligible, but he's here now. He's a really intriguing lefty at 6'10", 6'11". He's a fluid mover. He can pass it, handle it. Does a little bit of everything, but he's still very raw. In my opinion, he's more of a late first, early second type of swing pick, but it's hard not to love his upside and even get a bit carried away in it. Jake LaRavia has had a meteoric rise after the season with people having him as high as 20 on their board. Part of the reason is because he's actually 20 years old and not the listed 22. I can't quite get that high, but the 6'9 forward out of Wake Forest can defend, shoot it, and create a little offense, and he's now firmly in the first round mix. Christian Brown finally declared for the draft after taking his time basking in the national championship. He's in the late first to early second round range as a complimentary wing who does a lot of things well. I could still see him returning. I think he'd do numbers both on the court and off it with the NIL deals, but it makes the most sense for him to strike on his stock right now. Another sort of sleeper is Wake Forest, Alondez Williams. In a class that isn't great in the passing department, Alondez is near the top in my opinion. He's got good physical tools, a sneaky explosive athlete with a good handle and creativity at the basket. I think he should get some first round consideration and as he focuses on his outside shot, there's a high level contributor there. Arizona's Dalen Terry became a bit of a late riser for me over the course of the season. He's an energetic and expressive 6'7 wing who can defend, pass, and has made significant strides as a shooter that you'd love to see. And honestly, first round isn't out of the realm of possibilities. I want to see him continue growing offensively, but still at just 19, he checks a lot of boxes. There are a few notable others coming from unique situations, sort of indicative of all the paths and options to get to the league right now, but none quite like Yam Montero. I still think that Hoop Summit performance did a ton for him in solidifying his draft status, but his range is more like 25 to 35 than late teens like it might have been earlier in the season. Auburn's Walker Kessler put together one of the better shot blocking seasons I've seen. I think he's actually more mobile than he's talked about. I'm not placing a ton of stock into his three point shooting for a number of reasons. I think that'll all be an added bonus, but his mobility, rim protection, and touch at the basket should have him still getting those first round looks, even as people kind of soured on him after the shoulder injury. Terquavion Smith is a super exciting young guard. He put up some historic three-point shooting numbers in terms of volume and pull-up ability. He is still listed as 6'4", 160, which is not exactly league ready, but he's got a lot to like. Now, I would say his finishing is a pressing issue. Defensively, you have some concerns, but he's a first round talent. To me, the sweet spot for Kendall Brown is in that 20 to 30 range. He's too good of an athlete, cutter, has good defensive potential and high feel as a passer. He's not much of a scorer and needs to work on the handle and outside shot, but everything else points to him being key in a rotation. Watching more of Nikola Jovic's defense has me a bit lower on him. The offensive talent is pretty obvious, but he's going to need to make significant strides on that end. It doesn't necessarily have the physical indicators or track record to be confident in it, but he is still a first round talent. I think guys like Grant Williams, Dorian Finney-Smith, and even the Jay Crowders to an extent lay some groundwork for a guy like EJ Riddell. It gives you a lot of flexibility with his ability to defend multiple positions and protect the rim even at just 6'7". He's made great progress as a shooter and has a motor that's a big selling point for me. He might not have the highest ceiling but he's someone I definitely want on my team. While he needs some work as a shooter and maybe a bit more polish in the in-between game, Kennedy Chandler checks off most of the boxes as a contributing NBA guard, even at 6'1". 
I really like him defensively even at that size. He's obviously adept at getting to the bucket and putting pressure on defenses and routinely made plays for others. He might not have the easiest road to being a full-time starter, but a very good prospect nonetheless. Now I am still confident in Patrick Baldwin Jr. and I'd be willing to take that risk in the first round. At 6'9 with his natural offensive talent level it makes sense. Even if he's not a contributor right away, I think there's a real pathway to him at least carving out an eventual role and in these parts of the draft that's all you ask for. We might not have a Cade, Mobley, Jalen Green, Scotty Barnes type of draft at the top, but it does have a good amount of potential value, especially in a tier like this. You could probably break this up somewhere in the middle, but I have a lot of confidence in the chances this group has to contribute. In revisiting a lot of different players since the college season has ended, Santa Clara's Jalen Williams has really impressed me. I still love how well-rounded his game is. I think he can be a really solid defender and I buy his three-point shot. He's in that late first round realm for me. It might be that instant contributor everyone looks back at, like how did he end up here? Toledo's Ryan Rollins is one of the most talented scorers and creators in this draft and sometimes I even feel like I have him too low. He of course went to a mid-major and they didn't make the tournament so he's still relatively unknown, but the talent is there. He's a young sophomore as he'll turn 20 after draft day and to me he should be a first round pick. If he does get into that early second round, I'd be on the phone immediately trying to trade to get him. Now some may view this as being low on Mark Williams, but I think he's a really nice prospect. He has the potential to be an effective rim protector and lob threat, but beyond some hopes I have in his smooth shooting mechanics, I just don't see the value in him as a lottery pick over a lot of these other options. I really like what Blake Wesley brings to the table and even though on the surface he might feel like just another scoring guard, I'm a big fan of his defense. I'm actually a bit lower on him in the buckets department in comparison to some of his counterparts, but the well-rounded nature of his game, especially some of the playmaking, keep him in the top 20 area for me. Out of the wealth of scoring guards in this class, Bryce McGowan's might just end up the best scorer. Despite the skinny frame, he consistently got downhill and finished at the bucket at a high rate, and of course he had the terrific shot creation flashes on the perimeter too. He's already looking bigger which is a great sign, and I wouldn't be surprised if he gets his name called in the lottery. Another player that easily fits a similar archetype that we see throughout the playoffs is Marjan Bochamp. I've said it throughout the year, but I think we see him get more consistent from three and show off just a little more creation at the NBA level, but what he does, defending, cutting, making the right play is already super valuable. I'm not saying he'll 100% be on that level, but you look at a Mikael Bridges, a Cam Johnson, Trey Murphy, even Zaire Williams in terms of current role and think that Marjan could replicate that. Ochai Abaji's draft stock is going to be interesting to watch because he's a late bloomer who was the best player on a national champion, but maybe doesn't quite have the type of upside that lands you in the lottery and has a stronger reputation in some areas than he's earned, but he has done enough to be in this spot for me. He's a surefire first rounder who should be an early contributor in that sort of 3 and D athletic wing mold. I'm I'm honestly not sure why a lot of people went away from Jaden Hardy, especially when he got better over the course of the season. Now he does have some flaws and I still wonder about his transition into a spot where he's not close to being the guy, but his talent is obvious. 6'4", 2 guard who projects very well as a shooter and scorer and has taken strides as a playmaker. He did it all in the G League and I don't think twice about him being a first round pick. I think Ty Ty Washington could end up being an excellent value pick the way things are currently going and he might now be a bit underrated especially as a playmaker though know the numbers might not 100% be there as a shooter as well. You always have to keep in mind how he looked before that string of injuries and he's a prime candidate for the Kentucky bump in terms of role and things of that nature. You've heard it a million times at this point, but Malachi Branham really turned heads in that second half of the season and has probably earned a top 20 slot in June. I love his ability to score and make plays out of the pick and roll. He was one of the absolute best mid-range scorers in the country and his overall touch is very encouraging in him bringing that out to the three-point line.
Usman Jang has been a late riser for me and I think he will continue to be for a lot of people as they get to go back and watch more of his games. We often don't give enough time for development to young players drastically going up levels like Zhang did, and especially being in the NBL after Melo and Giddy, but he deserved more of that benefit. A big guard slash wing with the type of potential he showed on both ends against pros is a rare combination, and it's why I probably have him a bit higher than you've seen in other places. I'm, I'm okay. Shout out to him though, nice play. Jeremy Sohan is one of the very best defenders in this class, in fact I'd probably put him second behind Chet Holmgren in terms of hierarchy. He might not be the best shot blocker or stocks guy on this end, but he's a terrific lateral mover, was able to navigate screens and really play in a number of different spots. That's where the big appeal for him and his game comes from, but the playmaking, guard skills and shooting hopes bring him into the lottery for me. LSU's Tari Eason is pretty locked in as a lottery pick, and I can see him rising even higher on my board. He was one of the more all-around productive players I've seen off the bench. He's got all the tools as an athlete at 6'9 with a 7'3 wingspan. He put up stocks numbers only rivaled by Matisse Thybul. He just makes sense to me here, even with some of the concerns about his decision making, finishing, and shooting. Over the course of the year, I landed on Dyson Daniels being the Ignite's best prospect. He's one of the best defensive prospects in the class as a 6'7 guard, he's a very good passer, he showed enough offensively down the stretch to be confident in his progression at 18. He's not flashy, but will certainly make a lottery team happy. There's really not much new to say about Ben Matherin, he's been a pretty obvious lottery pick for me the entire year and I'm confident he's going to contribute as that athletic 3 and D guy with adequate abilities as a passer and shot creator, to me he belongs here. It was obvious in the moment, but especially when you watch back those Wisconsin games this season, Johnny Davis was putting up a ridiculous effort to make things happen and elevate them to that level. The reason I've ranked him here is because I'm confident in him expanding his game further to the three-point line, and defensively I think he's a little better than advertised. Keegan Murray is also in this group of intriguing versatile fours or big wings with Murray had one of the better statistical college seasons in recent years and really vaulted himself rightfully into lottery conversations with some people even liking him as high as fifth. I take a bit of a step back from that, we kind of mapped that out in his scouting report, but he's surely going to be a high level contributor in that top 10-ish range. I'm still somewhat working out the order of this group of players, I just think there's a lot to weigh between the youth, shooting, creation, and defensive capabilities of pretty much everyone here, but aside from maybe one from the tier above and below, I like where we're at in this general vicinity. Although he's still one of my favorite prospects, AJ Griffin's stock has taken just a bit of a hit for me after really tuning into his defense. I feel like if that was even 20% better than what it was, I might still have him just a little higher. He's a special shooter and shot creator, and I'm down with making a bet on his tools and athletic upside, but that's where I'm currently at on AJ. Jalen Duren maintains his place as the best traditional center in the class, and I think he's right in that tier below the top three. I see he's often mocked in a late lottery as late as 12, and to me if a team gets him in that spot they can go ahead and declare themselves the winner just off of value. One of the youngest in the class but also one of the most physically imposing, Duran has upside on both ends and should probably land in the 6-10 to 10 range. It's been a very strange last several months for Shaden Sharp, but he's now draft eligible and looks like he'll land very high on draft night. He's a risky pick just given the lack of sample size we have and some of his concerns, but he's a very gifted scorer and athlete with prototypical size, and that's very enticing. I have his scouting report coming out very soon if it's not out when you're watching this, so definitely check it out for a more in-depth look on him. Jaden Ivey is one of, if not the best athlete in the draft. He can obviously explode and jump with the best of them, but his first step is ridiculous, and it's a more functional asset to have. He'll likely take some time developing his pace and craft in the half court, but if he can put it all together, adding that pull up, the floater, and command the game a little more, he could very easily be the best player in the draft. Now my confidence in all that coming together over the others is why he's not quite in the number one convo for me, but he's still an easy top five guy. 
So I think we've pretty much reached a consensus on the top three to four prospects in the draft. But what's interesting about this year is nobody has really come to an agreement on the order, which I kind of like. For me at number three is Jabari Smith Jr. We spoke about him several times. You probably watched countless games and scouting reports on him. I believe he's a special shooter, a really good perimeter defender, and just an overall plug and play guy that everyone could use. Everything is kind of nitpicking at the top. I'm just not super confident in him as a driver and overall offense creator, but he's done more than enough to be in this convo, and if he doesn't become a really, really good player in the league, I'd be pretty surprised. Chet Holmgren is only polarizing because of his physical attributes, but he's got so much in his game to love, especially defensively, that has him safely in the number one pick conversation. Offensively, that upside and the way he can handle the ball, the flashes of self-creation, the versatility and touch around the basket, just make him a really nice prospect. And he ultimately holds down the number two spot. In there with the hands too, but this is the end result. Yeah, on one dribble to the basket. Might see it here. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Coming in at number one once again, we have Duke's Paolo Bancaro. Paolo just makes too much sense for me at the top of the draft. I know he's probably towards the back end of the top three or four by consensus at this point, or at least that's just how it feels. But at 6'10", he can create for himself and others. He's got potential to be a solid shooter and a lot of the defense stuff is overblown in my opinion. I think that Pistons Blake comparison really fits him as a big who can make plays inside and out and is still pretty athletically gifted. While it is still close, closer with the top three this year than last and maybe more similar to how I felt about LaMelo Ball and Anthony Edwards, Paula will likely continue to have the top spot. Now here's a look back at the entire board. I appreciate y'all for watching this video. If you did enjoy, please be sure to leave a like. Subscribe if you are new and comment down below some of your thoughts, specifically who you think is the biggest sleeper in this draft. I'm Keandre, this is Hoopin' Elect, and I'm out.